or I'll tell you, I'll, I'll show you what subtending means uh, of the length of the radius. That's it. So, in my circle, here's I have my circle, and I want to somehow measure an angle. There's one particular angle that we care about, let's say this one, theta, um, such that if I started measuring from here and measure along the path a distance of r, so r is the length of here. So imagine I take that length, it's a piece of string, and I just stretch it around the circle. The extent that I would have stretched it at, if I look at the angle that that makes, I call that a radian. That's called the radian. Um, incidentally, the uh, Wikipedia article on the radian is really cool. It has all sorts of animations and stuff. You should read it. So that's called a radian. Now, since the circumference uh, called a C of a circle is given by what is the circumference given by? Like the total distance around the circle. Right, 2 pi r. And it turns out, if this means if I were to divide the circumference by r, I would get 2 pi. So how many radians would there be in a circle? Well, it's going to be the same as take this length completely around the circle, divide it into r pieces. How many pieces would you have? You would have 2 pi pieces. This means there are two pi radians in a circle. <coughs> so there's one way to measure an angle in a circle. Uh, one way is the radian. This is just an angle that you would get if you stretch the uh, length of the radius around the circle. There are two pi radians in a circle. Um, another accepted measurement, uh, we really keep it around for the engineers. You know, those people who have to do log base 10. Uh, it's called the degree. Uh, this is an angle. slicing it up into 360 equal pieces, right? So this is 300 dot dot dot, okay? Then one of these slices, if you have 360 of these, the angle measure here is called a degree. There equals one degree. Uh, the notation here is with a little uh, circle on top of it. Now, that the degrees have been around for a long time, uh, so there were primitive, primitive reasons for why we decided to fund 360. Well, really it was because, you know, a year has roughly 360 days and everyone used to be all into the sun and, oh, you know, the seasons pass around roughly every 360 days, and this, they were like, oh, you know, let's imagine that the earth is moving around this, and one day is like a degree to them, so they're like, oh, okay, let's go to 360. Because 365 was kind of too. Like 360, 365 and a quarter degrees in a circle didn't really roll off the tongue. So they just said, uh, let's nut it down to 360. And so we end up with a degree. Um, so this means that there are 360 degrees in a circle. Um, this, by the way, means that 2 pi radians so the radians, these are, you either use rad to represent radians if you want emphasis, but usually you just write the angle, and any sane person would assume you're talking radians if you measure it, if you're talking about an angle. Um, but you put that little notch, that little circle here when you want to talk about degrees. But anyway, there are 360 degrees in a circle, 
So um, let's write this out. 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees. This would mean, for example, that uh, 1 degree is equal to pi over 180 radians. And 1 radian is equal to, uh, to 180 over pi. So this allows us to convert convert between the measurements. Now mostly I will be using radians because same. Uh, but uh, you should know if you're given anything in degrees occasionally how to switch between them. Convert between these measurements. Now there are a few special angles that we like. Uh, so I'll just mention those to you now. We'll see why they're <coughs> why they're so special in a little bit. Uh, so, for example, if I see 30 degrees, I know that that's going to be pi over six radians. If I see 45 degrees, that's going to be pi over four radians. If I see 60 degrees, that's going to be pi over three radians. So these are some very common measurements. We'll see why 30, 45, and 60 are nice things to actually measure pretty soon uh, when we talk about trig functions. But using these equations, I can do this conversion. So I guess you could know these. So unit circle. Know its equation. Uh, know what it is. Uh, know how to measure angles inside of it. Uh, that's that. Uh, let's talk about the trig functions. Now, About because we wanted to find a different way to represent points on the unit circle. And so we have the unit circle, it's right here, and we have a coordinate over here, and of course that coordinate is x comma y. And you might say, well, what's wrong with using x comma y? Well, for those of you who are going on into Calc 3, you're going to start to realize that there is a problem with measuring things in x comma y when you start to go three dimensions or higher. See, there are a lot of your math uh, starts to actually behave differently. And things that you're familiar with uh, in Calc 1, Calc 2, Algebra Pre-Calc, they're just not the same thing when you go to three dimensions. So for example, if you look at something that looks like a circle, that anyone would say, that's a circle, if they're in Pre-Calc, Calc 1, Calc 2, everyone would look at that and say, that's a circle. The person in Calc 3 is going to look at that and say, that's a cylinder, right? The object somehow changes forms. And so keeping things in terms of x and y isn't good enough. We want another way to express the points. It's not something that you're going to have to worry about for a while. But uh, that's how we came up with these new functions. Instead of thinking of it in rectangular coordinates where you tell me the x coordinate and the y coordinate, I want a new way to get to that point. Here's the new way we're going to do. We're going to connect it to the origin, and we're going to measure the angle that you make with the positive x-axis. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to invent two new functions that it's going, one of them is going to tell me what is the x coordinate when I give you a certain angle, and what is the y coordinate when I give you a certain angle. I call these functions sine and cosine. So I'm going to replace x with a function called cosine, and I'm going to replace y with a function called sine. At any given point, if you tell me the angle, this function is going to tell me what the x coordinate is, this function is going to tell me what the y coordinate is. Right? So if, for example, I'm up here at the point uh, 0, 1, now clearly, if I measure this here, that's going to be 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians. And I can say, for example, to get this point here, which is 0, 1, uh, this means your theta equals 90 degrees which is pi over 2 radians. And so we want the cosine of pi over 2 to give us 0, which is the x coordinate. 
and we would want the sine of pi over 2 to give us 1, which is the y coordinate. Right? So I just invented two new functions that are going to track the x and y coordinate for me in terms of the angle that I'm working with. Um, so, in other words, I can kind of think of here on the unit circle. x is going to be equal to the cosine of the angle, y is going to be equal to the sine of the angle. So, this allows me to talk about the x and y coordinates in terms of some other variable. And it turns out that is very convenient for higher level mathematics. Um, you're going to see something called polar coordinates in Calc 2, where they're going to introduce what I'm about to introduce. And you're going to play around with it, and it's going to be cool, and you're not really going to understand what the need for it is, but then you're going to get to Cal 3, and you're going to realize, oh, that's why we need it, to actually think of things in things other than x and y. Um, so, uh, we can make, uh, let's just, let me call, let me, so, these are, Important functions. We call them trigonometric functions. Or oh, trig functions for short. Uh, sometimes trig ratios. Uh, so sine theta and cosine theta are the main ones. But they're so important that inevitably the need is going to arise to talk about what if we divide these two, what if we multiply these two, what if we do things with them. And so we also uh, give names to their ratios. So, if I take the sine divided by the cosine, I call that the tangent function, uh, represented by tan theta. If I take one divided by the sine, it's the reciprocal of sine, I call this the cosecant function, abbreviated CSC theta. If I take one divided by the cosine, I call that the secant of theta, or abbreviated SEC, theta. So these, uh, and sometimes we want to take the ratio in the opposite way, cosine theta over sine of theta. We call that the cotangent of theta. Right, so these give us what we call the six trigonometric ratios because we're thinking of them as ratios. Six trigonometric ratios, they are talking about sine theta, cosine theta, tangent theta, uh, cosecant theta, secant theta, and cotangent theta. So there are these functions, but what do they do? They give us the coordinates on the unit circle. The cosine is going to give us the x coordinate, the sine is going to give us the y coordinate whenever you tell me a certain angle measured from the positive x axis. So now, let's actually study these. Uh, what if I don't want to be on the unit circle? I mean, the unit circle is cool and all, but there are other circles out there. So, let's say here you're on the unit circle. <coughs> and you want to also talk about, here's an angle of theta. This is going to be length one. I can actually write in, do this in a different color, draw in a vertical line, and draw in a horizontal line, and notice that the height of this vertical line is going to be, well, what the current x coordinate is, but I already know that that coordinate is, uh, no, that's going to be the current y coordinate. I know that that is sine of theta. And if I measure the base of this, that is the current x-coordinate, I know that that is cosine of theta. Okay. 
So this is why they're called trigonometry, by the way, or trigonometry. It's because it's triangle geometry. Where is the triangle coming in? It comes in when I draw in these lines. So now I have this right triangle. Now what I want to do is actually, let's extend this. What if I'm on a, I want to imagine that I'm on a bigger circle. And that radius is R, right, of any length. Okay, so I, now I'm on this coordinate here. I can draw in this line and I can draw in that one. Okay. So, here's what we end up with. We get uh, a triangle that looks like this. Where this length here is 1, this length here is r, this length here is whatever the current y coordinate is, this length here is whatever its current x coordinate is, I know that this length here is cosine of theta, and I know that this length here is the sine of theta. These are, what do we call these? If I look at this small triangle right here, and this big triangle right here. How do I refer to these two triangles? They're called similar triangles. <coughs> and in similar triangles, corresponding lengths and angles are equal. Angles are exactly equal, but the, the side lengths are proportional. So, uh, what does that actually mean? This means, if I look at the uh, height over uh, radius, I already told what this thing was, hypotenuse. Look at the hypotenuse there. So let's do that. The height of radius for the big triangle. This is going to be equivalent or equal to the height over base over the hypotenuse for the small triangle. And if I take the base over hypotenuse for the big triangle is going to be equal to the base over hypotenuse for the small triangle. Okay, so that's two uh, things I can get. Uh, one means, what is the height of the big triangle? Y. What is the hypotenuse of the big triangle? R. What is the height of the small triangle? Sine of theta. What is the hypotenuse of the small triangle? 1. 2 would mean, uh, what is the base of this big triangle? Well, it's X. What is the hypotenuse of the big triangle? R. What is the base of the small triangle? Cosine. What is the hypotenuse of the small triangle? One. So this means, well, sometimes we look at this as x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta, but I, we don't want to think of it that way. Um, I actually want to keep it in these ratios. In other words, I can look at the uh, sine of theta as just y divided by r, and the cosine of theta as x divided by r. Now, we give names to the lengths. So, uh, in a right triangle, 
if my angle is here, I call this side the opposite side. And I call this side the adjacent side. This side, of course, is the hypotenuse. Notice that the opposite side is kind of like your y value, if I imagine that this was on blah, blah, blah. And the adjacent side is kind of like your x value. So, 1 and 2 give that the sine of theta is what? y over r, opposite over hotness. What does the cosine give? x over r, adjacent over hypotenuse. Right? You also notice that if I looked at the tangent of theta, well, we know that that is sine of theta over cosine of theta, which is going to be, if I divide this by that, I would actually get opposite over adjacent. This leads to a very beloved mnemonic. It has fans, millions of fans all over the world. So da So da. That's, that's how I remember it. The, for some reason, the, the, the guy in my head who remembers Sobato is like a Chinese monk, very militant. He's like, it's his mantra. It says that sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Cosine is the adjacent. This is real. <laughs> Actually, I can forget it. Adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is the opposite over adjacent. Okay? So this kind of tells you if you have some random right triangle and you care about a particular angle, you can actually compute the sine and cosine of that angle by taking ratios of that right triangle. Uh, and we know that because of similar triangles, basically. If you figure it out for the unit uh, circle, you can get a right triangle with a hypotenuse equal to length 1. If you extend that, you can get this relationship, so ga toa. Very important. That allows us to uh, calculate these functions, which are very important, in an easier way, right? Using just measuring the lengths of uh, triangles. Hence the name trigonometry, that's triangle geometry. So, uh, what can we do with that? With this, now Sokato, with this, we can figure out sine theta, cosine theta, for some nice samples. Uh, so, here is how we're going to do uh, consider these two triangles. We're going to invent two triangles. One of them is going to be an equilateral triangle, length one all around, which means that each angle here is going to be 60. Right? We know about triangles, the angles have to add up to 180. That you would have known earlier. Uh, and then what we can do is we can actually slice this guy in half. One triangle uh, is the triangle that looks like this. This is one, this is can I sort of uh, make it proportional. Let's make this uh, two solid. So I can get a one here. So I'll start off with this length two all around. So now this angle here is going to be of length two. That one's going to be of length 1. This is going to be 60. And this is going to be 30. And of course, that's going to be 90 because I cut it with a vertical slice. Uh, another triangle that we can look at is this triangle, which is an isosceles triangle. Isosceles triangles, the guys that have two lengths are the same 
and then the third length, two lengths and two angles are the same, and the third length is different, potentially. So what we can have here is just that create a nice a right triangle where the height and the base are one, and therefore these will both be 45. And I want you to notice that we can actually figure out this length here by Pythagoras' theorem, right? <coughs> it's going to be triangle two, right? We can also figure out this length over here by Pythagoras' theorem. That's going to be radical 3. So the second triangle I have is this triangle. 1, 1, radical 2, 45 degrees, 45 degrees, and that one. And now, using Sokotoa, I can actually talk about sines and cosines for these angles, the 30, the 60, the 45, which is the guys that I wrote down before. Um, so from here, you can see that uh, the sine of 30 degrees, which is the same as the sine of pi over 6, this is. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so this is going to be 1 over 2. I can also talk about the sine of uh, 60 degrees, or, or 45, let's do it in order. 45, which is the same as the sine of pi over 4. That is going to be, well, uh, if I'm here, I want the sine of this angle that is opposite over hypotenuse. So that is 1 over radical 2, which I can write as radical 2 over 2 by rationalizing. Uh, I can talk about the sine of 60 degrees. This is going to be the same as the sine of pi over 3. And that is opposite over hypotenuse. So that's radical 3 over 2. And I can do the same thing for the cosine. Right? So I can have the cosine of 30, which is the cosine of pi over 6. I can have the cosine of 45, which is the same as the cosine of pi over 4. I can have the cosine of 60, which is the same as the cosine of pi over 3. And so cosine of 30 is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's radical 3 over 2. Uh, the cosine of 45 is a, a adjacent over hypotenuse, that's 1 over radical 2, which is radical 2 over 2. And the cosine of 60 is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's 1 over 2. Um, we can also notice that uh, sine and cosine are complementary. Notice that they complement each other. Basically what that means is this, if you look at the sine of an angle, it's going to give you the same as the cosine of 90 degrees minus that angle. And if you look at the cosine of an angle, it will give you the same as the sine of 90 degrees minus the angle. Right? They're both shifted apart from each other by 90 degrees because once you change your perspective, the opposite becomes the adjacent. So the angles switch, right? So uh, to this, the, the opposite is that, but to this, the adjacent is that. So they end up uh, actually complementing each other in that way. So we say sine and cosine are complementary, and these are the angles. Now, every now and then, you're going to have to figure out the sine or cosine of some uh, special angle like this, right? And a lot of students go to draw the triangle and try to figure it out and take forever. So we're going to be more efficient. Now that we know that this works out, I don't need to draw the, draw the triangles any, every time. I'm just going to come up with a very efficient way to remember this. Now, I know people like pictures, but it's actually way more efficient to remember this in a table. Uh, so normally what I do is I draw a table. Now, why is the table better than the, uh, the picture here? Is because there's a fun little way that you fill out the table, right? Which has a little, uh, I guess you could make a jingle to it. I, I don't think there's actually a jingle. But I'm sure you can make one. You guys have done Okay. Where you put the angle, the sine, and the cosine. Um, and you put these special angles over here. So, say, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3. Remember, this is your 30 degrees, this is your 45 degrees, this is your 60 degrees. 
So, here's how you fill out the table. Watch closely. Did anyone know? Anyone see? Okay. So here's how you fill out the table. Watch closely. Count up from one to three with a sign. One, two, three. Backwards with cosine. Three, two, one. Take the square root of everybody. Square root of one is just one. Then divide by one by two. Those are all the angles. So now you can see from the table, cosine of pi over four, radical two over two. Sine of pi over six, one over two. Cosine of pi over three, it's a half. Right? Cosine of pi over six, radical three over two. So there are a lot of times when we're doing, uh, I'm in class and we're measuring trig functions, and I'm like, okay, sine of seven pi over six, you know, this is gonna be uh, a half, and people are like, how do you know this? But, well, negative a half, actually. How do you know this so quick? And they're, they're drawing triangles, trying to figure it out. No, well, in my head, I have the table, right? So I know, oh, I can't face you by doing this. I know, knowing the table, on my left side, it's one, two, three in the sign, and I know that's 30, 45, 60. So if someone says, what is the sign of 60? My mind gravitates to the right side of the table. Uh, that is a three for the sign. Oh, the sign of 60 is radical theorem two, right? I don't need to actually, what was that triangle again? Oh, Pythagoras' is theorem, you find this side, and then I do this, and then I do that. You'll take forever trying to find the sign of pi over six doing that. Doing it in this table is very easy, because now you can just you can imagine where it is. Okay, what is the cosine of uh, pi over three? Well, pi over three, well, that's on the right side of the table for the cosine is three, two, one, one half, right? And you get very quick with that if you just practice a few problems. It's, it's amazing how quickly you would get with it. And then your friends gonna, you guys are gonna be studying together. Your friends gonna ask you, what's the sine of pi over six again? And you're gonna be like a half in like no time at all. So like, how do you know that so quick? And you're like. I work hard, man. You, gotta, you, gotta, you know, I'm up here every day hustling. You're, you're just, you're just chilling, man. Like, wake up early, work hard. One day you'll be like me. You'll know the sign of power six without even having to think about it. Man, you're right. I'm gonna work harder. Yeah. But in your head, you really had a table, so um, you'll, you'll actually be able to figure out these out very quickly. And will that table work for everything? You do it for sine and cosine. There's a way to extend it, but uh, I would do it for sine and cosine, and if I wanted to find the tangent, for example, well, I know it's sine over cosine. Okay, yeah. So if someone said, oh, what is the tangent of pi over 4? It's 1, because I see that the cosine of pi over 4 and the sine of pi over 4 is the same thing, divided. Right? What is the cotangent of pi over 4? Well, that's just divide this by that. Right? What is the tangent of pi over 6? Divide this by that. It's 1 over radical 3. Right? So if you know the sine and cosine, Remember, everyone else was built in terms of the sines and cosines. You know about sines and cosines. You know about everybody. Um, so it's nice to do that. You could actually extend this table even further. I usually don't do it, though. I don't actually even recommend that you do it. Isn't it easier to do the units or Like, if you wanted to find every single measurement, you can count. Like, you know, it's like... Um, one, two, three, and then three, two, one. Yeah. Like, is it there? Isn't there a pattern? Because I think I remember doing the pattern for all of them, where you could just like have memorize sort of one of them. You know okay. what I'm saying? Like instead of doing a chart to do the actual circle, mm -hmm. each of the. Do you think that's going to be easier? I feel like. See, and that would. Okay. What's cosine of seven pi over six? I mean, I don't remember that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but like. Exactly. Okay, because I did this in like I did this in like junior year, and I haven't been touched upon it. Okay. Well, well, I could, I could tell you some minus radical zero over two because I know the table. <laughs> so <laughs> you're gonna try it. Go home and try it. You don't even have to draw the table. That's how you can come. You can imagine that in your head. It's one, two, three. Three's on the right side in the top row, right? You don't have to draw it. You don't have to write anything down. You literally just kind of know it just by thinking about what position in the table you want to be on. You're going to sketch out the unit circle and literally write around it? Yes. Come on. <laughs> There's no way that's more efficient. But, but you can go home and you can try it. Do a bunch of problems using the table. Do a bunch of problems using your unit circle. I assure you, you will find the table is faster. Um, which, incidentally, goes in line with what I'm about to say here. You could actually extend this table. You could actually include 0 and 90 degrees. Right, so this is uh, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3. You could actually go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 
4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Uh, you can take the radical of everybody. And you can divide everyone by 2. This will give you 1 over here. This will give you 1 over here. So you can also get that the sine of 90 is 1. Uh, the cosine of 0 is 1. The sine of 0 is 0. The cosine of 90 is 0. Right? So you can also extend that. I would not recommend re remembering that, though. Uh, the smaller one is actually better to remember. Why? Because I'm going to show you the graphs of trig functions where 0 and 90, as well as 180 and 360, are going to automatically be memorized by you memorizing that other thing. So you're kind of doubling up on your memorization here. And in general, the problem with the unit circle, why it's not efficient, there's a memory technique called chunking. It turns out, if you want to memorize a large mass of data, it's really nice for you to chunk it into smaller chunks where each of them ha happen to have a special relationship to each other and remember the smaller chunks at a time as opposed to remembering the entire mass of data in one big chunk. When you're anxious and you're under pressure and your brain is just not functioning very well, for it to access that a huge mass of information versus one little tiny chunk of information, it's night and day, right? So the more you try to be comprehensive with your memory things, it actually, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. When it comes to uh, referencing things that you want to just know quickly, it's much easier and better to memorize it in smaller chunks than it is to memorize it in comprehensiveness. So do not sacrifice speed and efficiency for comprehensiveness when memorizing. You don't want to do that. So that's why this will beat out the unit circle, because for someone to actually draw in all these things and write in a bunch of stuff going this way and then going that way and then going that, that's more data for your mind to access and actually put down on the page. It's just, if you're going to be slower. Your brain doesn't work very well that way. But this, oh, there's just there's three columns. One, two, three. Your brain knows how to deal with one, two, three. Right? So that is how you are going to remember the angles. And I'm going to show you how you're going to remember special values of the angles, like 7 pi over 6. Like I, I asked you, what's cosine 7 pi over 6? I, I don't know. I know there's a finger method to remember the number of days in a month, but that's still oh, yeah. hard to me. I don't, I don't even, I don't even bother with it. So yeah. <laughs> I don't even want to. <laughs> you get some of So this is how you can memorize the the uh, values of the trig function at the special angles. Now, there is something that you can use on top of this called all students take crack. I mean calculus. All students take calculus. That is the PC version of it. Okay. Okay. What does that refer to? Well, remember how our trig functions work. They were developed based on the unit circle. You would notice that if you picked a coordinate here, both the x and y coordinate are positive. Right? If you picked a random coordinate over here, you'll notice that your x coordinate is negative, but your y coordinate is positive. If you pick a random number over here, Notice that both your x and your y coordinate are negative. If you pick the number over here, a point over here, you'll notice that the x coordinate is positive, but the y coordinate is negative. What does that mean for our trig functions? Well, this is your x and your y at any given time. And remember, the x corresponds to a cosine and the y corresponds to a sine. So basically, if we're in, these are called quadrants, by the way. I don't know if you guys remember that. That's one, two, we number them going counterclockwise, starting at the top right. Four, these are called the four quadrants. One, two, three, four. And you'll notice that if you're in the first quadrant, your coordinates for x and y are both positive, which means sine and cosine are both positive, which consequently means that tangent is automatically positive, which consequently means secant and cosecant are, are, are positive, which means all trig functions are positive. So all, that's the, all of them are positive in the first quadrant. 
Now you go over to the second quadrant, what's going to happen? Your cosine is now negative, right? Which means uh, your cosecant is going to be negative, your secant is going to be negative. However, everyone who only depends on the sine, they are going to be positive. So you'll notice that the sine is positive here. So you'll also notice also, of course, the cosecant will be positive. So the sine is positive in the second quadrant, so is the cosecant, but everyone else is negative. If you move over to the third one, you realize that both sine and cosine are negative. But that means if you divide them, uh, you get a positive, which means that the tangent is positive. So tangent is positive here, but the sine and cosine are both negative. Of course, if tangent is positive also, the cotangent is positive, but the tangent is the face of now if you move over here, uh, you realize that the cosine is positive, but the sine is negative. So here, cosine is positive. Also, of course, if the cosine is positive, the secant is going to be positive, but cosine is what you remember. So you end up with all students take calculus, right? Everyone is positive here, the sine function is positive here, the tangent function is positive here, the cosine function is positive here. And so that allows you to know not only the values of the trig functions, but the signs of them. The SIG. The signs of the trig functions. Okay? So another thing that you'll notice is that similar triangles also take effect. This means, let's say you're in this circle, and you are measuring a triangle over here where that's measured at 30 degrees. Well, you know what? If you were to measure a triangle over here where that is 30 degrees, it's going to be the same. You'll notice that the ratios are going to be the same. The only difference is you might have a sign change depending on SIGN. You might have a sign change depending on what quadrant you're in because of the all students take calculus. So combining the fact that we can use similar triangles with all students take calculus with this table, I can now figure out the values of the trig functions at uh, angles that kind of look like these but not quite. Things like 7 pi over 6, 5 pi over 3, 4 pi over 3, 5 pi over 6. So, Combining these, What is the cosine of 7 pi over 6? What is the sine of 5 pi over 4? What is the cosine of, what's the other one that I didn't try? Pi over 3? Let's do something with pi over 3. Uh, let's do 2 pi over 3. These guys are fully reduced, they're improper fractions, you can't really cancel the 3 or the 6 or the 4. So basically there's always going to be a pi over 3 factor here, and there's a pi over 6 factor here, there's a pi over 4 factor here. Um, so you actually know what cosine and sine is, is at pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3. We know that from the table, now we know that from the table, we know how to say that quickly. What if I have 7 pi over 6's or 5 pi's over 4's? or two pi's over threes. How do I figure out the values then? Well, here's what we're going to do. We are going to look at our circle. So let's figure out cosine of seven pi over six. By the way, when you get really good at it, you're gonna be able to do it in your head, honestly. Um, 
So, you look at pi over 6. What does pi over 6 mean? Well, it means divide pi into 6 pieces. Right? That's pi over 6. Pi divided by 6. So, we know this angle here is pi because that's half of a circle because a, circle, a full circle is 2 pi radians. Okay? I want to divide pi into 6 equal pieces. How do I do that? Well, divide into 2 equal pieces, then divide each half into 3's. I can do the same at the bottom. So now I have a pizza pie where uh, the angle on each of these things is pi over 6. There's a pi over 6 angle here, pi over 6, pi over 6, pi over 6. I divided the whole circle into a bunch of pi over 6's. Now, what does it mean 7 pi over 6? Well, it means I take 7 of these pieces. So I start here and I count them off. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 pi over 6, which is pi. 7. What that does is that lands me in the quadrant where I know all students take. Right? So that tells me what is the cosine in that region. It's negative. So this means. But again, notice what I have here. The triangle that I would have used to figure out the cosine here is going to be exactly the same triangle I would use to figure out the cosine here. So what's going to happen is I'm going to get that my cosine of 7 pi over 6 is just going to be the negative of the cosine of pi over 6. And what is the cosine of pi over 6? Well, radical 3 over 2. I know that from the table. That's on the left side of the table. So this is minus radical 3 over 2. So when you think 7 pi over 6, well, you're thinking pi is in 6 pieces. The 7th piece is going to be slightly in the third quadrant. So that means the cosine is negative, and I know what cosine of pi over 6 is. You just focus on that part. And then, okay, it's going to be negative the cosine of pi over 6. It's going to be radical 3 over 2. This part you can tell very quickly based on the table. The sine you can tell very quickly based on all students take calculus. So we just combine those two methods, and we can actually figure out these other guys. Um, what about sine of uh, 5 pi over 4? How would you look at that? the circle, yeah, figure out where our pi is, okay, now what? Divide pi into four pieces, because I have pi over four. So I'm just going to divide pi into two, then divide those two into two. And I can do the same thing here. Now you go around five slices. 1, 2, 3, 4, you know that that's going to be 4. It's 5. So that also puts us in the third quadrant where the sine is negative. So the sine of 5 pi over 4 is going to be equal to the negative of sine of pi over 4. That's in the middle of the table. That's radical 2 over 2. Right? What is sine of? 7 pi over 4. Let's, let's just throw this in there. 7 pi over 4. Well, all students, da, 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 that's 7, right? Because 2 pi is 8 pi over 4, so 7 pi over 4 is there. Sine is still negative. It's still minus radical 2 over 2. What's sine of 11 pi over 4? Let's see that in a different color. So we know, well, you don't count from 1, 2. You know to, to there, there are how many pi's of 4's in a full circle? 8, right? 9, 10, 11, 12. Oh, oh I 11. 8, 9, 10, 11. All students, that's positive. That's positive radical 2 over 2. Yeah, because to go around in a in a full circle, there is only two pi's. Right. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pi over four, which gives you a full two pi. Right. But then I need to go further. Nine, ten, eleven. You okay. just continue okay. to loop around until you land in, and you, now you know. Oh, I landed in this quadrant. Okay. Then you can use all sides take calculus to figure out the sign. S I G. 
cosine 2 pi over 3. Okay, uh, tell me what that is. Cosine of 2 pi over 3. Yeah? What's positive? It's all students take calculus. So if you're over here, you're positive. Who is positive over here? So it's negative. So the cosine is negative, and where's that pi over 3 show? You guys have to practice a little more to be able to do it in your head. It's okay. You're not going to get it right away. Right away. So, I. You divide to three equal pieces. One, two, three. Two pi over three means you take two of these slices. One, two. This puts you in, of course, the second quadrant. <coughs> We know that all students, so here, cosine is, is negative, right? Negative. Now, so now I know that this is just going to be equal to the negative of cosine pi over 3. Because I would figure that out based on this triangle, which is going to be exactly the same as that triangle. And cosine of pi over 3, pi over 3 is 60, which means that's in the right side of the table. In the cosine level, what goes on? 3, 2, 1. So it's 1 over 2. So you can and should uh, be able to do that in your head. So once you can actually do it in your head, then you know you're ready. So if someone says, what is the sine of 7 pi over 4? You should be able to count that in your head. You know that that's going to be in the fourth quadrant, right? You know that the sine of pi over 4 is radical 2 over 2. You know that all students take calculus, so the sine is going to be negative. So it's negative radical 3, negative radical 2 over 2. Sorry, I didn't have to draw anything to, to figure that out. I just, just by me knowing the relative positions of things, uh, my brain can get to the answer very quickly. How much time? What else do we want to talk about? Well, I'll mention that later, I'll mention that later. Or maybe, maybe I should mention that now. I don't know. Probably, I probably should mention that now, because if I don't mention it now, I'll probably forget to mention it. So, also. Recall. This whole thing started with the unit circle, where that was x squared plus y squared equals 1. So note, since our x, I think of this as a cosine, and our y, I think of this as a sine, this means that if I were to take cosine squared plus sine squared, I would get 1. This is a very important, uh, what we call it, a trig identity. This is called the Pythagorean identity. How do you know it's called Pythagorean identity? Basically because we use this, we use Pythagoras' theorem to figure out that, so it's automatically built into this. Uh, use the a squared plus b squared equals c squared to figure this out. Um, so this is called the Pythagorean identity. So, by the way, this leads to so, Pythagorean identities. You can build a whole family of these guys. Um, the first one being cosine theta squared plus cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Now, what you realize is that I can divide everyone by cosine squared. So if I divide this by cosine squared, I get 1. 
If I divide that by cosine squared, I get tangent squared. If I divide 1 by cosine squared, I get secant squared. So this gives us that 1 plus tangent squared is equal to secant squared. And this I figure out by divide the above by cosine squared. And if I divide the, this by sine squared instead, um, I would also get, uh, I would get the cotangent squared plus 1 equals the cosecant squared. So these guys together are called the Pythagorean identities. They're all based on cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1, uh, which you definitely should know. The other two you don't really have to memorize directly. Just know this and know that I can divide through by cosine squared, and I would get this. If I divide through by sine squared, I would get that. I forgot to mention that earlier, so I know if I don't mention it now, I'm going to forget again. That's a part of the danger of making something too intuitive. You just kind of, it's come so natural to you, you never remember to have to explain it. It's like, oh yeah, they definitely know this. I don't know if you know this. Uh, what else do I want to talk about? This is skipping ahead a little bit. Probably the next thing it makes sense to talk about is the idea of a reference angle but I don't know if I can fully flesh that out how I want to in 10 minutes. So I'll probably talk about the graphs of uh, the sine and cosine. So this is also something you should know. Um, so basically remember, we have the unit circle. And our sine and cosine are measuring the coordinates. So I'm going to kind of use me moving around this circle to figure out what is going to be the graph of, say, y equals sine of x, and what is going to be the graph of y equals cosine of x. start from the angle zero. So here's one, here's minus one. I know they'll never give me a, a number bigger than one because it's bounded by one. Here's one, here's minus one. So I know that it'll never pass this line. That, that's, that's not a part of the graph, that should be broken. It's also probably natural to think of the, uh, the actual axes as somehow markers for, uh, so I'm going to put in a line that I'm going to represent when we hit pi over two. I'm going to put in a line here that represents when we hit pi. I'm going to put in a line here that represents when we hit three pi over two. So that's this angle here. So here your theta equals zero, here theta equals pi over two, here your theta equals pi, here your theta equals 3 pi over 2. And of course, if you go around, <coughs> this is equivalent to theta equal 2 pi. So I'm going to put in another one for 2 pi. I'm going to do the same over here. So these aren't the graphs. These are just uh, markers that will kind of tell me where I am at any point. So, uh, let's focus on the sine. So the sine is measuring the y value. What is the y value here? Well, it's zero. So at zero, the sine starts at zero. Now, as I move between zero to pi over two, what happens to the y value? Well, it slowly increases until it hits one. So I'm gonna move from here to here. So there's gonna be an arc that goes like that. 
and then, okay, what happens as I move from here to here? Well, the y value goes from 1, and it decreases now to 0. So from, as I go to pi, this is going to come back down and hit 0. Well, what happens as I travel from here to 3 pi over 2? My y value starts at 0. It now becomes negative 1 by the time it gets here. So now this is just going to continue to trace down until I hit negative 1 at this point. And what happens in the last quarter? Well, uh, the y value is now minus 1. It will literally increase and increase until the y coordinate is 0. So this is going to come back and hit 0 right here. So that's the sine function. Of course, you should realize that I could have just kept going, right? So technically, this we could have kept this thing going literally forever. We'll talk about that next time. And I could also keep this going back literally forever. But between 0 and 2 pi, these, this is called the standard or the principal period of the sine function. And that's what the graph is going to look like. And I know that's what the graph looks like because I know what the sine means. It's tracking the y coordinate as I move around the unit circle. So it'll be 0 here, it'll be 1 at pi over 2, it'll be 0 at pi, it'll be negative 1 at 3 pi over 2, and it'll be 1 at 2 pi, 0 at 2 pi. Uh, I can do, play the same game, but now I focus on the x coordinate. So if I start at 0, where's the x coordinate? Well, it's at 1. So the x coordinate starts here. Now what happens as I move to here? Well, my x coordinate decreases until, at this point, x is 0. So it's going to move down until it hits zero. It's going to look like that. And what happens if I move from here to here? Well, the x-coordinate is at zero, but if I do this, the x-coordinate actually decreases, right? Because over here, the x-coordinate is minus one. So it continues to move down until it hits minus one. And then, still watching the x-coordinate, it's at minus one. Moving over here, the x-coordinates for each of these points, as I move along the circle, the x-coordinates are tracking back here, so it goes back to zero. And now in the last leg, uh, the x-coordinate is here at zero. As I move along this circle, the x-coordinates trace back out, goes back out to one. So it'll hit one over here. So that is the principal uh, period for cosine. And again, this could continue forever in both directions. But this is what you really know. And now you automatically know a bunch of other angles now. Uh, you can know from this graph that the sine of 0 is 0. You can know that the sine of pi over 2 is 1. You can know that the sine of pi is 0. You can know that the sine of 3 pi over 2 is minus 1, you can know that the sine of 2 pi is 0, etc. Right? You can know all those angles for cosine again. So the graphs allows you to memorize a bunch of other angles. So now we know what trig functions are. We know about Sokoto, we know how to measure them at special angles, and a bunch of other angles. So we will pick up with that next time and start to learn some cool, some more cool things.